Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to this Hive webinar. It's starting a co-op right for you. Thank you for joining us for this session. Um, my name is Petra Morris and I work at Cooperatives UK and I'll say a little bit more about um, Cooperatives UK and my role there. Um, I'm also being joined today by my colleague at Cooperatives UK, Dame Pollard, who will be speaking about legal forms and how you register your cooperative. Um, but it will essentially be me taking you through this presentation. Um, so there may, um, hopefully everyone has, has managed to join okay. And I know some people online today are groups looking to understand more about cooperatives and maybe wanting to set one up, um, but also maybe other organizations that themselves are working with groups or local authorities or support, support agencies. So everyone's very welcome. And I hope after this one hour session, you'll have a better understanding of what cooperatives is a cooperative is and the support that might be available if you want to find out more. So just in terms of housekeeping, before I go any further, um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, so it will be available um, as a link and we'll upload it to the website. So it's available after this session. And because it's a webinar, your cameras are off and you don't have any audio. So please do use the chat box at the bottom to ask questions as we go along. And then we can pick those questions up at the end of, of the presentations by myself and, and Dane, hopefully. Um, so just going, moving forward. Um, so as I said before, um, I'm Petra Morris and I'll be joined by Dane Pollard. And the reason we're running this um, Hive webinar today is that it's part of a series of Hive webinars that we've been delivering towards the end of last year and beginning of this year. And it's all part of a programme called the High Business Support Programme, which is delivered by Cooperatives UK in partnership with the Cooperative Bank. And we've been delighted to work in partnership with Cooperative Bank for the last six years on this programme. And we've supported more than a thousand cooperatives during that time with consultancy support, peer mentoring, training and other resources. Um, and Cooperatives UK, we are the national body that represents cooperatives. So 7,000 cooperatives across the UK. And as a membership organization, we provide advice, services, um, events, policy work. Um, and once you start your cooperative, we hope you become members of Cooperatives UK. So in this session, I'm hopefully going to um, cover uh, what a cooperative is um, and how it's different from other forms of business. Um, and I'll also talk about the different examples of cooperatives and how they're owned by their members. And then, as I said before, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dane Pollard at Cooperatives UK, who will take you through the legal structures. And then finally, we'll finish off with what support is available if you do want to take things further. And as I say, as, as I'm going through, please do use the chat to ask any questions. So I'll start by talking about what a cooperative is. And at its most basic, cooperatives are um, a group of people coming together to share common needs um, and they can form a business, a cooperative. And the main thing is that that cooperative is, is, is then owned by the members and they control how it's run. Um, and those members can be workers, they can be the customers or users of the service, they can be the wider community and the residents, um, or even the suppliers, or they can be a combination of those um, members, as we call them, multi-stakeholder cooperatives. And so we have cooperatives of, of workers that are as small as three members, and then we have large consumer retail cooperative societies that have millions of members. So um, they range in, in size and, and, and shape. And membership is very much at the heart of every cooperative. They are the foundation of the cooperative and it's why they exist. And it's the very purpose of why cooperatives are set up. So it might be that workers come together because they want more control over their um, work and how they make decisions and they want more equitable work and flat structures. They want to have a share of profits and are motivated for that reason. Um, and members also are um, share, share holders and owners of the business and they control those decisions and members can invest, invest in a cooperative, but that shouldn't be the primary purpose and the reason for why they 
um, choose to set up the cooperative or, or invest. Um, and because cooperatives are businesses, they aim to make profits. It's just how those profits are distributed is different to um, traditional and private businesses. Um, and again, the member, members would have a say in how they use those profits and how they're distributed. So membership is key and, and that democratic ownership is really important and it's what distinguishes cooperatives from other business models. The other thing that makes cooperatives different from other businesses is that they work to a set of values and principles. And these principles um, are worldwide. So cooperatives all around the world share those same principles and we have an organization called the International Cooperative Alliance that kinds of, kind of looks after those principles and makes sure that it's embedded in cooperatives. Um, and so if your cooperative can't demonstrate those principles, then essentially you probably are not a cooperative. So I'm just going to go through each of these very briefly just to explain what those principles are. Um, as they are important. And later on, when you hear from Dane, he'll be talking about the different legal structures that are available to co cooperatives. Um, but these principles really are at the heart of every cooperative. So as a member, uh, membership is voluntary and open. So many of you may use your um, local convenience um, food store cooperative, um, and you can buy food there even if you haven't taking out the membership card and you're earning your dividends. So it is voluntary and open. And democratic member control is really important, as I said before, because cooperatives are set up to meet the needs of their members and those members have a say in how the cooperative is run. And um, that's quite powerful and quite different to lots of other businesses. Member economic participation, this is again about the transaction that happens with the members, the benefits that they can receive, whether that's a share of dividends or a share of the profits or other um, benefits in terms of the services they may have access to. And because, because cooperatives are there to serve their members, um, primarily they need to be independent organizations and have autonomy, even if they may be funded by various other organizations. And in order for members to make good decisions and to have that control over their cooperatives, they need to have the education and training and the skills to do that. So education has always been a big part of cooperatives and we, we tend to spend a lot of time making sure that, that cooperatives are trained. And that's one of the things that Cooperatives UK does is provide lots of training sessions. Um, the next one, cooperation among cooperatives, this is again about, um, we call this principle six, and as it suggests, it's the idea that cooperatives support one another and they, and they promote cooperatives. Um, and being part of a large cooperative movement is really powerful and there's lots of cooperatives ready to support you. And finally, but not least, is the idea that cooperatives are there to, to support their community. Um, and lots of the larger retail cooperative societies, and particularly in this last couple of years through the pandemic, have supported their communities, they support lots of charities, um, and cooperatives, you know, that's very much key to their principles that they have ethics and values and they do have a concern for their community. Um, and, and that's come through very strongly in, in the last couple of years through the pandemic. Um, so as I say, these, these principles have been around for a very long time, over 175 years. They go back to the first cooperative that was set up in 1844. Um, and they still thrive today and are embedded in, in a cooperative. So we've, we've seen that cooperatives are owned by their members. We see that they operate with particular values and principles. Um, and all of these things help to make cooperatives successful. And one of the things we know, for instance, is that cooperatives' startup survival rates are much higher than traditional businesses, almost twice as, as high. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that. I think the fact that people have a stake in the business, they have control of the business, they're much more motivated, um, there's more innovation, there's more productivity. Um, and, and it's a really powerful thing to think that, you know, this cooperative is serving our needs and the, or the needs of our community. Um, and that leads to kind of long-term resilience and, and productivity and innovation. And cooperatives are generally people-based um, businesses are focused on people 
they're generally more trusted and they're doing things for the right reasons, whether that's about the environment or social impact. Um, so all of these things um, and the fact that they've been around for more than 175 years demonstrates that the cooperative model works. And just to take that resilience further, what we've seen, particularly in the last couple of years with the pandemic, is that cooperatives have been more resilient than traditional businesses. They've certainly been less likely to cease trading, four times less likely. Um, and again, it goes back to, I think, the ownership model and how they're governed and, um, and you know, they're there for their members. So it's, it's, they can be more flexible and pivot. And when I talk about some cooperative examples, hopefully that will come to the fore a little bit more. Um, but certainly cooperatives have, have been resilient and they've been more ambitious and continue to want to grow through this difficult period. And so I mentioned before that cooperatives are, um, come in all shapes and sizes and they operate in all sectors of the economy. And all this slide is, is showing is that we have cooperatives that are food growers, cooperatives in arts and culture and digital, energy, every sector. And all told, there are 7,000 different cooperatives, all different sizes, and they contribute nearly 40 billion pound to the UK economy and year on year generally are growing um, in, in size. So cooperatives continue to be relevant, whether it was the 1840s when the first cooperative shop was set up by the mill workers, uh, the Rochdale pioneers through the 70s when there was high unemployment and lots of worker co-ops were set up and currently, um, and again, lots of cooperatives have sprung up in the wake of the pandemic to kind of solve the problems of whether it's freelancers coming together or, or other issues. So cooperatives meet um, their are a way of meeting people's needs and, and um, are, are continue to be relevant. And this next slide just um, talks about that a little bit more. So all the things that are important to us in society, whether that's access to decent quality housing, um, whether we care about climate impact and climate change. And for the customer, the gig economy and the fact that at a click of a button, we can order our taxis, we can order our food, we can order our holidays really quickly is great, but there is a downside to that in terms of the gig economy and those working in, in those um, sectors, tech sectors, often don't get such a good deal. So cooperatives have been springing up and um, growing in, to address all of those areas um, some for a long time. So we have hundreds of housing cooperatives that are developing housing not for profit, but to be sustainable and to provide decent, um, affordable housing. We also have hundreds of community energy groups that are setting up projects around renewable energy, whether that's hydro or solar or retrofitting, or just simply reducing our carbon footprint. Um, and again, they're all owned by, owned by their members or the community. And finally, more recently, we um, have a program called Unfound, and that's trying to, I suppose, disrupt that um, tech um, industry a little bit by having alternative models of platform cooperatives, digital platform cooperatives, um, which are owned by the people who care most about them, and that's the workers and the people receiving the benefits. And I'll say a little bit more about that in, our, in the case studies. Um, so um, cooperatives, I've always found um, solutions to the things that affect us mo most, when, whether that's food, housing, energy, or the way that we work. So I said before that cooperatives are owned by their members, and those members can be um, the customers, they can be the workers, they can be the community at large, or a combination of those. So in these next few slides, I'm going to give some examples of cooperatives and how they're owned um, and how that makes a difference to how they run their business. Um, we have thousands of cooperatives to choose from, so these next case studies are just a snapshot of, of, of those. Um, so I mentioned before that most, most people when they think of cooperatives are very familiar with their convenience corner food shop um, and 
um, indeed, those are what we call consumer societies and retail societies, which are owned by the customers. So when you do buy your one pound membership card, you're then a member of that cooperative in a food store um, and you can earn dividends um, on, on your purchases. Um, you also get to go to the AGMs and have some voting rights and you can join local um, councils. So you're very much part of that governance as a member. Um, and here we have um, a cooperative called ScotMed in, in Scotland, the largest independent cooperative retail society. Um, they have 280 stores. Um, and like many retail stores of that size, they do lots of good things within their community and support them, and more so um, in the pandemic. Um, they celebrated 150 years um, back in 2009, so they've been going a very long time. But it isn't just convenience stores and food um, that represent cooperatives, um, and um, the Wine Society is an example where their members are the purchasers of, of wine. They're essentially a wine society based in, in Stevenage. They source wine from all over the world and sell it to their members, and their members get all kinds of benefits like discounts and events and wine tasting. Um, and they've been going for 130 years and have 90,000 members. So it's just a different kind of cooperative and a different way of, of running it. So the next um, examples of cooperatives I'm talking about are worker cooperatives. So as it suggests, the members are the workers themselves. Um, and there's lots of reasons for workers coming together, but generally the idea is they're much more motivated, they're in control, they, have, they can make those decisions collectively, there tends to be less hierarchy, um, and obviously if they make profits, that's distributed among the workers. Um, so we have hundreds of small worker cooperatives, um, and here's a couple of examples. Um, so Lupine Adventure are a cooperative, a small cooperative up in, in Leeds, as the picture there shows, they provide um, outdoor recreation opportunities, um, and they also help young people through the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Um, and they've just come together as a cooperative to have a little bit more control over that work, um, have a stake in, in, in that, and, and it makes them more successful at what they're doing. And in London, we have a cooperative that we supported through the Hive called Infact Digital. They have four members, they're quite small and they provide digital web services. Um, and they really came out of that idea of tech for good. Um, we have an organization called CoTech that have lots of members all doing different digital products and services, and they're all trying to use tech for good. Um, and essentially, um, in fact, we're working collectively already, informally as a cooperative, and through the Hive, we were able to support them to formalize that, that cooperative. Um, and they just, as they said here, being a worker co-op mot motivates us so much more. So I mentioned before about um, unfound and platform digital cooperatives, um, more ethical ways of running um, those kinds of businesses. Um, and here we have a couple of examples of cooperatives that are their members are both the beneficiaries and the users of the service, um, but also the workers and the caregivers providing those services. So Signalize is a cooperative for um, the deaf community and their members are users of that service and also the deaf interpreters. And so collectively they can make sure they're providing the kinds of services um, that work for both parties. Often uh, deaf interpreters work through agencies, um, traditionally in um, the private market, um, and they're not very well served by them. And similarly, the deaf community don't get access to the deaf interpreters that they need. So this, this is a new way of, of, of doing um, that service through a cooperative. Um, and again, we were delighted that the Hive was able to set them up back in 2019. And they're going from strength to strength based in Merseyside um, and has just started winning contracts um, for their work. Equal Care Cooperative has been around again, not that long, about four years. Um, this is again, an, an, an innovative way of doing um, a cooperative. Um, we all know that social care doesn't always work. Um, so this cooperative has as at its members, the beneficiaries of the care services and also 
the caregivers. Um, and so collectively, they can um, run their cooperative more efficiently, but they're also using platforms or digital solutions to kind of provide a matchmaking service online to make that more efficient and effective. So I mentioned before that um, cooperatives are great solutions for things that matter to us and access to good housing is really important. Um, and so I'm really excited by this um, cooperative called Latch, uh, again, based in Leeds, since obviously a hotbed for cooperatives. Um, and Latch basically take derelict properties and they convert them to make them decent housing, particularly for people, vulnerable people who um, don't have access to good housing. And not only do they convert those, those buildings and residences, but they also provide training opportunities and, and work for the people um, in those houses and they work in their community. Um, and recently they did something called a community share offer and raised £550,000 from their members in order to buy even more properties and convert them. And I'll say a little bit more about community shares as we go along. Um, and here we have an example, again, of housing for students. Um, student Cooperative Homes is a federal body, and they can purchase housing and then lease it to um, students. Often students are in the hands of private um, landlords and, and rents are put up and they don't have much control over that. So again, this is a different solution to help students um, and also gives them good experience in running a cooperative and learning those skills. So a couple of examples there around housing, um, but also about, I suppose, supporting their local communities. And so this final slide about case studies is two cooperatives um, that operate really to benefit their community and provide services within their community. Um, so Flows, the place in the park is down in Oxford. And this is a lovely um, new cooperative um, came out of uh, Oxford County Council's Children's Centre, which was going to be closed down. So the community came together to operate this wonderful building in, in the park in Oxford. Um, and this centre provides a nursery, provides a cafe, a refill shop, um, and lots of services to the local community. Um, and they decided to form themselves as a cooperative so that they're serving their, their members. Um, and one of the things that they were able also to do is raise funds from a community share offer from their members um, to invest in, in the center and provide services that they wanted to do. Um, and finally, this example of Friends of Stretford Public Hall, that's one that's very dear to me. Um, and I'm not working at Cooperatives UK, I'm a volunteer director at Friends of Stretford Public Hall which is just outside of Manchester. Um, this is a beautiful grade two listed building, um, which was, um, has been around since the 1800s um, and has always been a sort of multi-use building in one shape or another. It's been in the past a library, a swimming pool, um, and it's been a theatre. Um, and when the council were going to sell the building, potentially to pri private investors, private developers, in 2015, the community were able to come together and do an asset transfer. So it's now owned by the community. And we were able to do a community share offer in 2017, and we raised 250,000 pounds from our investor members. Um, and today the building is, is used by lots of people who come in for events, for well-being, for yoga, for exhibitions, music, um, weddings and, and, and everything else. Um, so it's really exciting to see how, how the, that building has, has developed. So I've mentioned a few times here that one of the things that members can do is invest in the things that they care about, whether that's energy, housing, or, or community assets and buildings such as um, these two here. So I'm just going to touch on what community shares are. Um, this could be a whole workshop and session um, on its own, um, but I'm just going to very quickly describe what community shares are and why that's so powerful, particularly for communities that want to take on services and assets that are meaningful um, and benefit um, them. Um, so to give its official name, community shares is actually withdrawable share capital, and it's a way that members can invest 
it's almost like making a donation, but with without um, you know without it being a charity, and then you have some democratic democratic rights as part of investing in in that cooperative. So you can attend the AGMs, you can join the board or, or committee of of that cooperative. Um, and you have a say in how the cooperative is run. Um, these shares, um, the only thing you can do with them is withdraw them or occasionally earn interest on them. So you can't, it's not really about making money out of them. It's quite different. Um, and to date, hundreds of communities around the country in the last 10 years have raised, actually it's more than 180 million pound now since we did this slide um, from over hundred thousand investors. Um, and there are lots of examples of communities, whether that's swimming pools, pubs, farms, um, listed buildings, um, you name it, that have used community shares to um, develop their services and, and their buildings. So it's a really powerful way that cooperatives have of, of um, supporting their communities. So I'm going to take breath there, I think, um, and just... Um, just to summarize then, we know that cooperatives are businesses. They operate to a set of principles um, and there's lots of different types of cooperatives that are defined by their principles, but also how they're owned by their members. I'm just very quickly, um, just mindful of the time, just quickly going to touch on the fact that um, there will be support available. And um, when you're thinking about setting up your cooperative, it's much the same as any other business, you're either responding to an opportunity or a need, um, you need to test that need and, and check the feasibility, and you need to have the right people behind you. Um, and unlike setting up maybe as a sole trader, you do need to have a group of people who are motivated and share your same values and principles um, and vision. So having that collective, collective vision is really important. And that vision will also determine what the purpose of the cooperative is and will help you to start thinking about what kind of cooperative you should be um, and who your members would be um, and what impact you want to create. So luckily for you, one of the things that we have on our website is the step-by-step -step guide. Um, and it literally does as it says, it takes you through each of the steps of setting up your business from testing your idea and feasibility to checking whether actually a cooperative is right for what you're trying to do, to how to finance your startup, your business planning. And then we have a whole section around legal structures. And finally, once you've done all of those steps and you're ready to register your cooperative, you can do that through our online digital service, um, which again has been subsidized through the High Business Support Programme and the Cooperative Bank. So I'm going to. Um, draw breath there and finish and thanks very much for bearing with me on on learning that introduction to cooperatives um, I'm now going to hand over if I may to my colleague Dane Pollard at Cooperatives UK um, I've talked a lot about the different types of cooperatives and Dane will now take you through the legal options and, and how you register your cooperative um, I'm going to be changing the slides for him so he, he will let me know when when they need to move on so over Today, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Petra. Thanks for all that. Um, yeah, just a quick introduction. I'm Dane. I work in the advice team here at Coach UK. Uh, we are a relatively small team, but cover a wide range of skills and experience in uh, governance and HR advice. And my role primarily is to assist new organisations with their incorporation. And that can involve discussions around different legal forms and different structures at the start of people's journeys. Um, first slide, please, Petra. Thank you. Uh, just to remind everyone that you can post any questions or comments in the chat and we will uh, get to them at, at the end and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So that first slide there is talking about incorporation. So should you incorporate? Um, most cooperatives do incorporate, but there are circumstances where remaining unincorporated is actually most appropriate. What does incorporation mean? Uh, it means creating a legal identity for that organization. Um, sorry, somebody was calling me on the other phone there. Uh, creating a legal identity for the organization that is distinct from its members, uh, which means it then becomes a corporate body. Um, as the slide says, uh, it's uh, incorporation then limits the personal liability of your members and directors. 
And it's the legal entity, which is then a person in the eyes of the law that takes on that risk. If you remain unincorporated, your organization is uh, more informal, which means the law sees you, uh, sees the cooperative as a collection of people, um, which are the directors and the members, and not the legal entity in its own right. The organization itself can't enter into any contracts, and it's more difficult to give members the authority to enter into uh, contracts as well on the organization's behalf. And the liability to the directors is what's known as joint and several and is unlimited. And that means these liabilities may not be shared equally among the members. And it's often those who have the ability to pay are the ones that are pursued more for any um, payment of debts. It's worth saying here as well that contractual liability will ultimately rest with those who have authorised the contract. So, for instance, if a committee member was to enter into a contract and the contract was authorised by an imaginative committee, each committee member would be held liable under the terms of the contract should something go wrong. If a committee member acts on their own without the authorization of the committee, then they can be held personally liable. Obviously, incorporation will create a limited liability, uh, but a director can still be held liable if they act outside of the authority of the board. When you do incorporate, it means your business will have specific rights and duties to follow. So you legal, uh, sorry, you register as a legal entity under a particular act of legislation with a particular regulatory body, such as the Companies Act 2006, which is regulated by the com by Companies House. And what this means is you will have uh, startup fees. You will have to keep and file records with the appropriate registrar, and you'll have to make certain details public, such as your registered address and um, board and director names. So when should you incorporate? Well, if you plan to own property and or enter into significant contracts, such as employment contracts, if you undertake significant trade or you want to own significant assets, uh, if you want to just limit the personal liability of your members as well, um, the, the legal entity then takes on that risk. Being unincorporated might suit your co-op better if you uh, have a more informal setup and your exposure to those risks are minimal. And obviously the advantages of remaining unincorporated are uh, the sort of no or very limited startup or annual costs. You don't need to declare any details with public registers and, and there's very little admin um, officially. If you want to explore more about that, uh, that aspect of incorporation or not, we have a, a publication called Simply Legal and you can download that from step five in our step-by-step -step guide that Petra showed you. And it is important to say that you, you shouldn't rush into incorporation if there is no particular need to at that moment in time. Some businesses can start off informally, tickle on quite nicely um, without the need for any contracts or employees or anything that would incur that sort of risk. Um, and then once they're ready to sort of move forward and grow, you can then look to incorporation. And usually by then they'll have a better idea of what the business is going to look like. So when the time is right, you will want to make that change. Uh, thank you, Petra. And you're ready to incorporate. So once you've made that decision, <clears throat> you're gonna to need to go through um, these, these points here. So you've got to decide your cooperative structure. Do you know who your members are gonna be? And do you know what their relationship will be with the co-op? So why should they be members in the first place? And Petra has already told you about the different types of co-op that you can have, um, and it's also worth remembering that every single co-op is different, even within the same particular type and structure. Uh, so it's important to think about what's going to suit you and your business and your members best. You need to have a business model and a business plan, because as Petra said, the co-op needs to have a business behind it, and you want that business to be successful as well. So what is your mission and vision? Why are you starting the business? You know, what need is there out there that you'll be addressing? And possibly most importantly, for the sustainability of the business, where is your income coming from? Will you be reliant on trading income or grants, or loans, especially at the startup? What do you need to get things off the ground, including any registration costs? So then you decide on a legal form that suits your needs or preferences and do have a look at all the different ones. We'll touch on this at the end of my section um, because there are some differences and some similarities between them. But you've got to pick one that suits you again and what your needs are. Um, so Petra mentioned withdrawable shares, for example, they're only available if you register as a society. So we draft the constitution or you adopt a model constitution. 
that you want your co-op to, to follow. And that will be the document that uh, if you're a co-op, you'll have the values and principles uh, included or entrenched throughout there to make sure that the, everybody is following those cooperative values um, whilst administering and governing the, uh, the business. So once you get your governing document sorted, you've got to think again about what your co-op needs uh, to be successful. And to help you with that governing document, Cooperative UK has many different model constitutions that will suit all different legal forms, including unincorporated, if you want to stay that way. And you can view the majority of those at step 5.5 of our guide. So we did say it was helpful. Um, if there's something on there, oh, sorry, if there's something that you want that you can't find on there, feel free to give uh, us a, an email at advice at uk.coop and we'll have a look for you. So once you've done all that, you're ready to make your application, you've got to go to a relevant registrar. And depending on what legal form you'll have, there'll be a different process for uh, that registration. Cooperative UK also has a registration service that is uh, currently being subsidised by the Co-op Bank. And as part of that service, you will help, um, we will help you draft the constitution, we'll help you prepare the application form, liaise with the registrar on your behalf uh, until the Co-op is registered. And once it's registered, we'll even throw in membership to Corpse UK at no extra cost should you wish to join us. And you can find more details about that at step six of the guide. Okay, moving on. Thank you, Petra. Previous slide um, and legal forms. And the first point to make is that a co-op can be any legal form. So in the UK, there is no particular legislation just for cooperatives. So again, do your research, look at the options and decide what fits you best. There'll be some reasons to incorporate that demand a certain legal form, uh, but in some cases it can simply be personal choice or preference. The main legal forms we see used uh, commonly are the standard ones that you're probably more aware of, which is a company limited by guarantee or a company limited by shares. Um, and the other legal forms we see are the cooperative society, community benefit society, and there is a charitable version of the community benefit society as well. Other legal forms, you can have uh, community interest companies, which are known as KICs, and they can be limited by guarantee or by shares. Uh, CIOs are charitable incorporated organisations. LLPs, limited liability partnerships, and uh, public limited companies. They can all be co-ops, um, and you can write the constitution to have cooperative values and principles throughout. Uh, but we see these a bit less than the others. So things to think about when you're choosing that legal form are what type of business you're going to carry out, who are the members going to be, their interaction, how will you fund the co-op, especially at the startup stage, and what the co-op will do with profits that it makes, um, any surplus. And then finally, what's the co-op going to do with its assets when it winds up? Next slide, please, Petra. So if we look through them in a bit more detail, I appreciate this looks a bit of a complicated slide, uh, so don't worry too much. It's just an overview, an illustration of how the legal forms are interlinked and how they differ. So, for example, at the top there, you can see uh, the legislation for the particular legal forms are registered under. So we have the Companies Act on the left, which is probably the most familiar, and then the Cooperative and Community Benefit Societies Act 2014 on the right, and then finally the Limited Liability Partnership at the end. So if we start with the companies on the left, they're registered under that act and they can be limited by guarantee or by shares. Uh, private company limited by guarantee means that all the members will guarantee a certain amount of money, which is usually a pound, uh, in the event of the company being wound up and still having outstanding debts. Uh, one pound from each member is probably not going to cover all the outstanding debts, but the point is it's, uh, it's limited to that, that, uh, that one pound, and it's a commitment anyway. Uh, the private company limited by shares means that the liability of the shareholders is... Um, is the capital that they've originally invested. So the nominal value of the shares and any premium paid in return for the issue of those shares by the company. So all the shareholding would be at risk in the case of, uh, of winding up with, with debts. The public limited by company, uh, sorry, the public limited company as well is on there and they can issue shares to the public. They're generally used by the large capital-based ventures um, we don't really see cooperatives registering as, as PLCs um, because they're on the stock exchange. They don't have to be, um, but they can be. And um, they'll have to follow the different listing rules as well if they're on the stock exchange. So again, we just don't really see many co-ops do that. 
So moving from left to right there, we can look at societies next. And they are corporate bodies in exactly the same way as companies are, which a lot of people don't quite understand in the wider world. And they're registered under the Cooperative and Community Benefits Societies Act 2014. And they are administered by the Financial Conduct Authority, whereas companies go to companies' house. Societies can be registered as a cooperative society or a community benefit society. The co-op society legal form is used by all types of co-ops to meet the conditions for registration. Uh, the FCA state that the society must be an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned enterprise, which if you remember earlier, um, we mentioned the ICA um, International Cooperative Alliance, that is their statement as well. So the, the FCA are just uh, picking up on that statement and making sure that anyone who applies as a cooperative loosely meets that um, definition. The Community Benefit Society legal form is more common uh, with the community owned businesses uh, and the other forms of voluntary and community activity uh, where the emphasis is to benefit the wider community rather than the society's specific membership. A community benefit society uh, or CBS as they're known has the option of adding what's called a statutory asset lock as well. And the asset lock is designed to ensure that all the assets of the organization, which includes any profits or other services generated by its activities, are used for the benefit of the community um, and the wider community. So on any winding up or, or dissolution, um, any remaining assets must be given to another asset locked organization, usually with similar objectives as well. So what it just means it's the intention of your society, you're keeping those assets there, you know, in perpetuity really. Once you put an asset lock, a statutory asset lock into a constitution, it can't be removed either. So uh, new businesses should really think about the advantages and disadvantages of doing that uh, before they include it. <clears throat> so also on this slide, we have LLPs. Um, sorry, it's better to stay on that one, thank you. Um, and they are subject to the Limited Liability Partnership Act. <clears throat> Excuse me. This legal form um, provides a limited liability for its members in the same way but it's a flexible structure and it has tax advantages um, for being partnerships. And they're usually uh, more profit-making activities. Um, the kick is on there as well, but that's in the, um, the Companies Act and the Companies thing. And the kick is looking at the wider community benefit as well in a similar way that the CBSs are. Um, and their kicks are often formed when companies are not quite charitable, but they still uh, want to do things for the, for the wider good and for the community. And there are two key features that distinguish the community interest company from other um, companies. And it is that the asset lock is in a kick as well, but it's compulsory. So unlike a CBS where you can choose, um, the asset lock is compulsory there. And to register a kick, uh, the community interest test must be passed, which means uh, kicks are registered with company's house, but also the kick regulator is the one who decides on whether or not the organization passes that particular test. Um, the CIOs are on there as well, and um, they are. Uh, there's a Scottish CIO as well, and that is more charitable um, organisations, which again we see less of uh, when they're being co-ops. To be honest with you. So finally, just really going to quickly touch on the the little circles there on the right hand side, and that is the withdrawable shares that uh, Petra mentioned earlier, and they're only available on the society model. And as Petra said, they are par value. It's not creating some kind of um, exchange where you can buy and sell shares. Uh, you invest shares and you can withdraw shares. You can transfer shares if it's specified in, in your constitution. But again, we don't often see people with a transferable uh, withdrawable shares. And as Petra said, we could spend a long time talking about um, withdrawable shares, uh, but it is optional in societies. And um, it is where the, the it'll be specifically mentioned in the rules as well as to what you can do and to how many shares you can have. Um, there's no requirement to specify an amount of share capital when you register. You can just say it's an option um, and then you can do share offers where you can raise as much money as you need to. Uh, societies have exemptions from the Financial Services and Market, Markets Act 2000, which uh, includes exemptions for uh, covering financial promotions, basically, which can reduce the cost of share issues. It's still risk capital, though, and despite the exemptions, the FCA will expect the society to provide appropriate information 
regarding this risk to investors. So your share offer document needs to, to clearly spell that out. You can pay interest on those shares. However, the interest will uh, payable has to be set at a rate that is what the SCA deem necessary to obtain and retain enough capital to run the business. So it means you can't see it as an investment opportunity, for example. Those people investing should do it for socially motivated or philanthropic reasons rather than uh, the prospects of financial return. And the SCA do look very closely at that. So when people register and they want to do share offers, um, they will often look at social media or websites just to see how the society are actually talking about um, those share offers. Okay, final slide, please, Petra. Thank you. So just quickly going to end uh, this section for, for my part today, looking at the, the pros and cons of the two main legal forms that I've spoken about. And this is a really quick uh, overview with some examples here. And there may be more on each side of these tables. And if you ask different people, they may tell you different ones as well. But these are sort of more obvious ones. So with a company, it's a bit quicker to register, um, but there is a bit more admin ongoing. Um, so with a company, you can often get registered within two to three days, which is really great. With a society, it takes a minimum of three weeks for the FCA to get back to you. So you're looking at maybe four to six weeks sometimes <clears throat> for that one. The company is a more recognized legal form. Uh, you know, if you go to banks and, and insurance companies and things like that, they will know a company because they're familiar with, with it. But they don't really understand societies as much. So that can be a bit of a challenge for, for cooperatives and something that we are continually, continually lobbying for and to try and make it a level playing field. Um, the society model, as we just discussed, has withdrawable share capital, which the company doesn't. The company can um, be limited by shares, of course, but they are uh, subject to the different restrictions and the legislation around those shares. Uh, the Companies Act really is designed for sort of your standard for-profit businesses, um, whereas a society, a society is seen more as a, you know, a wider community benefiting uh, organisation, even if it's a co-op, the concern for the community is still in the values and principles there at principle seven. So um, it's, it's sort of seen as a different perspective from some people. The company has more prescriptive legislation, uh, which can be a pro and it can be a con because obviously it tells you more about what you can and cannot do. Whereas a society, the, the act is relatively small in comparison. So a lot of things are left out of that and seen as the, for the members to, um, to sort of govern themselves. However, in any sort of cases where legal intervention is needed, they will always default with the Companies Act or case law if, if it can't be found that way. So it's not that you can sort of, you know, skirt around the law a bit more with a society. You very much have to do the same sort of thing, but it's, um, it's more for you to, to manage that way. And that's about it from me on that section. Uh, I'll hand back to Petra, but I think we're going to look to any questions as well. Um, and I can see one in there we can answer Petra. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to answer that whenever you want. Thanks very much, Dane. And uh, I think that for me, always with this legal section is the flexibility of the cooperative model, as, as Dane said, is that you can essentially be any legal form and still be a cooperative. It's the principles that make you a cooperative. And we do have these model um, governing docu documents, templates um, that you can adopt. Um, and, the, and I'm just putting this slide up again, just to remind you that you can go through the step-by-step -step and all of this is available, including registering your cooperative. Um, so just before we go to questions, I'm just going to touch on the fact that there is more support available if anyone wants to take this further. Um, the High Business Support Programme, as I said before, we're delighted that, that we've been partnering with the Cooperative Bank. The Cooperative Bank themselves um, follow our values and principles, they're very much an ethical bank um, and are keen to see the cooperative economy grow. And so people can apply for support to the Hive that's open all year round for applications um, and you can get up to 10 days of bespoke support, mentoring or training. Um, the advice team at Cooperatives UK again have lots of resources and support that they can give you in terms of your journey as a cooperative and we also run lots of training and I know Dane is doing a training session tomorrow for directors so um, I think that's booked up now. Um, and we also have the Community Shares Unit at Cooperatives UK, which manages um, that work around community shares. And we have a programme called the Community Shares Booster Programme, which again, groups can apply to if they're ready to do their share offer and get development support 
or even equity match funding. So for each pound they raise from their community, um, that's matched through the community shares booster equity funding. Um, so all of these, um, I think we've put links to these in our chat um, and we'll follow up um, with this with a link to the recording of this webinar. And also we have the offer there if you would like to speak to myself, um, you can book an appointment with me if you want to talk through your idea and whether you should apply for support. Um, so let's look at questions. I think there have been questions as we've gone along. Um, There's been so a, a couple. Yeah, we can start with if you've got any questions, pop them in quick and we'll try and answer them um, before we finish. But uh, Amanda said, uh, can you change who the members of the co-op are as the co-op develops? And she said, for example, could the workers be the members initially? And then at a later date for customers to be invited to become members. Um, so the answer to that is yes, of course, co-ops grow and, and change, you know, organically as, as things move on and, and they hopefully thrive and become successful. I think it's important to think about, certainly at the beginning, what do you see your co-op as doing long term? Um, and the reason I say that is because it's easier to add extra member categories in your constitution at the beginning but maybe not have anyone in them at that point it it's not difficult but it's harder to change it because you have to go to the registrar to register a change of constitution if you're adding more members in a future a future date but if you don't know for example that you want customers to be members until later down the line then absolutely you have to you'll have a process laid out in your constitution that tells you what you need to make changes and effectively, that will be calling a general meeting and the members will vote on adding these new categories in. They will be added in. You'll register it with the registrar and then you'll have a new constitution moving forward for those members. So, yeah, the, the easy answer is yes. Um, it can get more complicated and difficult depending on the, you know, the situations. But, um, but it, you've got to do what's best for you at, at whatever time you're doing it. Um, Christina then said, what legal structures do platform cooperatives most frequently use? Um, not a great answer, Christina, but uh, any <laughs> and all of them. So it, as I sort of said there, that it doesn't matter what legal form you choose uh, as to what co-op you are. It's about what you need from your legal structure. Um, so we have platform co-ops that use societies. We have platform co-ops that use companies. It has to be said that the main legal funds we do are company limited by guarantee, and the cooperative society and the cooperative, uh, sorry, the community benefit society. So most of them fall within those brackets. We have companies to buy shares as well, um, but it, it then literally comes down to what's going to suit the co-op best. So again, it's just doing your research. Um, and it's not to say you can't change either. Again, if you start as a company, for example, because it's easier and it's quicker and it just suits your needs at that time, and then two years down the line, you think, actually, we want to look into withdrawable shares now and involve the, the community or the wider stakeholders a bit more, then you can convert. You can't convert every single legal form. So obviously, do take advice on what you want to do. Um, but we also help with that as the advice team as well. So yeah, any is the answer. <laughs> um, uh, Kim has said, if the business is already incorporated, can this be developed into a co-op? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it's any legal form can be a co-op at any time. So if the sometimes cooperative buyouts, which Petra might be able to tell you more about if we've supported through the hive, but um, you, you convert to a co-op, it, it usually means you just change your constitution. So you might do a complete amendment of articles or a complete amendment of rules, um, and then, then you can become a co-op. Of course, if you want to be a co-op, you need to get other people to want to be a co-op as well so you couldn't decide that you want your business to be a co-op and then force your employees to be members for example uh, open and voluntary membership is uh, is paramount on that one um petra i don't know if you want to say this one but uh, can you advise on the optimum number of people who should be involved at startup i can tell you that there is a minimum number of three for a society and we would deem a minimum of two for a company but would you say there was an optimum number, Petra? Um, I would, I guess it depends on the type of cooperative you're setting up and how representative maybe you want it to be and also some of the skills that you might need at that startup. So yeah, there isn't a figure that we would recommend, but it would obviously depend on the nature of the business and who your members are and how representative it is and, and, and that you actually have 
the capacity and the skills and the people to, to do that. So it will, will vary. Um, in terms of my own experience of being a board member at Stretford Public Hall, I think our board, we have a maximum of, of 12 on our board, um, but we have I think currently 10, so we have two vacancies at the moment. Um, and um, but yeah, it, it varies to, from each cooperative, um, and, and it depends on the nature of the cooperative as, as, as well. So yeah, can't give you a, a definitive answer on that one, I'm afraid. But as as Dane said, for societies, particularly if you're setting up maybe a worker cooperative, the minimum is, is three people. So that's something to to consider if that's what you want to do. I think there was an early. I don't know if it was a question or an observation, but I think someone said that they particularly wanted to set something up around. A publishing business. Um, I don't know if that's publishing as in um, books or what kind of publishing. Um, we do have a few cooperatives that operate in um, kind of newspapers and in publishing. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things you could do is have your customers as, as members as well as the workers and have a multi-stakeholder cooperative. Um, whenever you start having a multi-stakeholder cooperative and different members, You've got to keep all those different stakeholders happy and you've got to put aside often your own needs perhaps um, to ensure that you're buying into the, the whole vision of the cooperative and what the purpose of the cooperative is so keeping everybody happy is is always a challenge if you're going to have different types of users and different types of members um, but obviously if you, you know any business where you've got customers and, and people who are going to purchase from you having them as, as members is, is probably quite useful is that a fair response, Dean? <laughs> yeah, I think I think she was in, introducing herself at the beginning. Yeah, but she just commented that uh, it was Kim again, and uh, yeah. she's going to be in books and working with young writers and creatives. So, yeah. no, that's w brilliant. Watch this and space. I guess we're seeing lots of interest from the creative industries um, and, and technical, looking at cooperatives as a model, um, and particularly where sort of you know people maybe who work as freelancers and independents can be quite a lonely job and, and there's not much support so a cooperative kind of model and, and having that umbrella and that support around you but still having that independence and freedom is, is a really good um, way for cooperatives to um, come together so we're seeing quite a lot of interest in that and in fact one of the earlier webinars we did was around freelancers and worker co-ops and that is still available on our website so do take a look at that if, if that's that's of interest. Um. Petra, so Tim's just asked, are there any online or platform-based language teaching cooperatives? Um, I don't know if you know any off the top of your head, but just before you, you answer, we do have a directory on our website. If you go to our website, at the very top, I think it says find a co-op, and you can search by sectors uh, as well as regions and co-op types and things like that. So that might be helpful to those looking to see what else is out there. But Petra, do you know any uh, online language ones? Yeah, we have one that we just supported through our Unfound Accelerator program um, called uh, Red Brick Language. Yeah. Um, I think that's more for um, teachers of English as a foreign language. And we also have something called My Cool Class, which is fairly new, which is um, providing teaching online to um, internationally, not just in the UK. So. Again, if, if you um, Google my cool class or um, the Red Brick um, language school, um, that there, I think we have some case studies on, on that one on our website. Um, but yeah, we've seen a lot of interest in online teaching, not least because of what's happened in the pandemic in the last couple of years. And a cooperative model is a great solution for that as well. I'm getting lots of questions in now. We may not be up to. Yeah, no, Christina was just saying that the. Uh... <laughs> The accelerator program, uh, Red Brick, I think is what you were talking about, Petra, there. I think yes. they, they won one of the unfound things, didn't they? So They did, yeah, yeah. and the, point, they Christina, are featured as, as a case study on our website. Um, so I don't know. Is that I think good? we've covered the questions there. So unless anyone's yep. got any quick ones, okay. um, yeah, there's plenty of links on there. So hopefully you've managed to click on a few of them as well. And... Uh, Yes, so that, that kind of ends our, we've, we've kept to time on, on the webinar and what we said it would be an hour. Um, thank you again to Dane for excellent contribution. Um, our advice team are always on hand. Um, you know, if you do need um, some guidance on legal form and, and as I say, our step-by-step -step guide takes you through that process. And we will send out emails after this, this um, webinar with the link to the recording 
and the offer is there from me to have a conversation with me as well if you want to um, just um, get a bit more guidance before you maybe apply to the high business support program. So thanks again for joining us. Um, I think we'll close there and um, I hope you found that useful and look forward to hearing from you maybe soon in the future. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.